Good evening, everyone, and welcome uh, to the Spring McCarthy Lecture Series on the Catholic Church in the 21st Century. I'm Dr. Andrew Prawl, and I'm the Provost here at St. Edwards this evening. St. Edwards University created uh, this evening's lecture series to honor Bishop McCarthy, who led the Diocese of Austin from 1985 to 2001, and to underscore the university's commitment to Catholic and Holy Cross heritage. Bishop McCarthy passed away this last August, and we are delighted to continue honoring his legacy with this series, which is now in its 14th year. So my role here with you this evening is the very important task of introducing um, this evening's phenomenal speaker. But before I do so, I also want to recognize uh, somebody else, someone who's actually been very instrumental in not only maintaining but also burnishing and uplifting uh, this wonderful McCarthy Lecture Series over the last several years. Dr. Steve Rodenborg, would you please stand up? <laughs> Steve has been coordinating and curating the McCarthy Lecture Series uh, for the last several years, and you've done a phenomenal job. For those of you who aren't aware, Steve will be moving on to Dean of Faculty role at Salve Regina uh, at the end of the academic year. You will definitely be missed, and we especially appreciate all of your work uh, and your dedication to the McCarthy Lecture Series, uh, as well as your role as chair and director of our honors program in so many other ways. So thank you very much, Steve. I think Steve's making that transition because he sees how much fun we have in academic administration and you know, wants a part of that uh, pure joy. Uh, so now my attention turns to introducing our wonderful speaker this evening, Dr. Michael Lee. Dr. Lee is an associate, a full professor now of theology uh, at Fordham University with affiliation in Fordham's Latin American and Latino Studies Institute. Born in Miami, Florida of Puerto Rican parents, he holds his graduate degrees from the University of Chicago and the University of Notre Dame. His research focus on, focuses on Roman Catholic theology, liberation theologies, uh, Christology, spirituality, religion and politics, and Latin American and U.S. Latinx theologies. Dr. Lee is the author of numerous articles, chapters, and books. His book, Bearing the Weight of Salvation, The Soteriology of Ignacio e Corcoria, won the, 20, the 2010 Hispanic Theological Initiative Book Prize, sponsored by the Princeton Theological Seminary. His most recent book is Revolutionary Saint, The Theological Legacy of Oscar Romero, in which he asks, how do or should Christians think and live differently because of Oscar Romero? We will hear his thoughts this afternoon on that very question. Dr. Lee has also served on the governing board of the Catholic Theological Society of America and as president of the Academy of Catholic Hispanic Theologians of the United States. His commentary has appeared in a wide variety of venues, including the New York Times, Rolling Stone, and Alfaro Academico in El Salvador. He is also a frequent commentator in the media, having recently appeared on networks including CNN, Al Jazeera America, ABC in New York, NPR, and Radio France International. So I know that many of us are inspired um, by the life of Oscar Romero, and I know I appreciate the wonderful turnout that we have this, this evening. So without further ado, please help me extend a very warm hilltop welcome to Dr. Lee. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here. As I looked over the list of previous McCarthy lecturers, I thought, what the heck am I doing here? Uh, so it's wonderful to share this, um, principally because I think our subject for tonight, Monsignor Oscar Arnulfo Romero, is a remarkable figure. And a person who canonized as a saint in the Roman Catholic Church this past year provides us a really powerful example of what it means to be a Christian uh, today. Saint Oscar Romero, 38 years after his assassination on March 24, 1980 in San Salvador, El Salvador, he is canonized a saint. For many, this was a long overdue statement. 
great joy. Finally, he's a saint. And yet, for others, it was a cause for concern. It was a very difficult and controversial process, this uh, naming uh, and recognizing Romero as a saint. I had the good fortune to be in San Salvador a couple of years earlier when <clears throat> Romero was recognized as a martyr. And, and this was the key step in beatification, the, the, the many steps that it takes to become a saint. Well, in San Salvador's cathedral in the basement, in the crypt, there is still every Sunday the Romero Mass. And people come throughout the country to celebrate the legacy of Oscar Romero. And after the jubilation of this announcement that he had been recognized as a martyr, and this would surely lead to his sainthood, I spoke to an old woman who was a little concerned. And she paused and she said, ¿Qué van a hacer con nuestro Monseñor? What are they going to do with our Monseñor? So really, though many might think sainthood is a kind of door that is closed, in many ways, it's a door that is only opened now. That fear that perhaps his legacy might be co-opted, might be distorted, was confirmed by many when the Archdiocese of San Salvador uh, uh, let loose its motto. It's, it had a commercial jingle and the slogan, Romero, Martyr for Love. I spoke with um, Monsignor um, Tojera, a Jesuit who was a former uh, president of the Jesuit University in San Salvador, and he said to me, hmm, Martyr for Love. Of what? And that's an important question when it comes to Romero. Why is he a martyr? What dimension of love do we see in this person? Who is this Saint Romero? This is a question that is only beginning to be answered. And it's one that constantly has to be answered. Right? It's a process of negotiation over his memory and what he means to the living church today. We can think about Dorothy Day's famous line about the possibility of her own canonization as a saint. She said to me, ah, don't call me saint. I don't want to be dismissed that easily. Right? It's this tendency to somehow put saints on a pedestal where they don't really challenge us. They don't really make a claim and ask us about the lives we lead and maybe the direction they should be led. Now, Oscar Romero is a, a well-known figure, uh, archbishop in San Salvador during its uh, tumultuous period that led to its civil war. He was nominated for the 1978 Nobel Peace Prize. If you go to Westminster Abbey in London, you'll see his statue on the western portico with other 20th century martyrs, including Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Martin Luther King. So a famous figure known around the world. And yet, can we get beyond the facade? Can we see who the meaning of this person is? I mean, think about how we in the United States recognize Dr. King. This figure who now has his national holiday. But do we lose something, right? Do we hear that challenging king still pushing us? That king that, that united the issues of racism and poverty and war and challenged the United States to be more than it was. Do we have that kind of figure in Oscar Romero? Can we say who he was? Or at least can we say who he wasn't in the face of some who might want to water down his challenging legacy? What is Romero's meaning for us today? This evening, what I'd like to do is suggest three important ways. Three ways that I think people can think A.R. after Romero. The first has to do with the idea of conversion. 
It's a term that's used. It's a term that's abused. But I think in the person of Romero, we have a remarkable example of conversion, and we have a person who spent his ministry preaching about conversion and demonstrating what conversion might look like for all people today. Secondly, he teaches us something about discipleship, about what it means to be a person of faith in the world today. And as people of faith in the world today, we are immersed in politics. What is that relationship between faith and politics? And how do we, do we try and ensure that either one of those is not abused in the process? We see religion distorted. We see politics distorted. But might Romero show us a way to live out one's convictions, to live out one's values in a powerful way that makes an impact to our larger society, and even to our global community. And finally, martyrdom. A scary word for some, and certainly when one speaks about martyrdom, one has to be very careful. It's a painful uh, phenomenon. And for some, martyrdom can seem like bloodthirst. But for Romero who not only paid the price with his own life, but during his ministry as archbishop saw six of his priests murdered. Martyrdom was a special role. In fact, he began to talk about the call for all believers to be martyrs. What might that mean? So let's begin with conversion. Now for some, uh, conversion is this profound experience Uh, Think about St. Paul in the New Testament who's knocked off of his horse, shining light, and who makes a dramatic change in his life. This was not Romero's experience. Oscar Romero was born in 1917, and by the time he was 13 years old, he entered into seminary. Imagine, 13 years old, going into minor seminary. He spent decades of his life as a priest. And then finally he becomes archbishop as he turned, uh, just as he was turning 60. This is a man who had a profound faith his whole life. So to talk about conversion or the possibility of Romero's conversion is not to talk about someone who's gone from no faith to a powerful experience of faith. Nor is it the description of someone who has kind of lived a a sinful life, turning away from, oh, some kind of uh, dangerous or, or hurtful activity. This was not a prodigal son. As I said, decades as a priest. In fact, when you read his diaries, the image you get of Romero is someone who is extremely scrupulous, always writing about how he wasn't praying enough, he wasn't being good enough, he wasn't fasting enough, never good enough, so scrupulous about everything he did. A real church mouse this guy was. So, what is his conversion experience? Well, for anyone who knows the story of Romero, they often refer to this figure, Rutilio Grande. Rutilio Grande was a Jesuit priest. Oscar Romero knew him well. They lived together for a few years at the major seminary in San Salvador. And in March of 1977, Rutilio Grande, who had become one of the most outspoken leaders in the Catholic Church in El Salvador, was driving between the two towns in which he worked, Aguilares and El Paisnal, with an old man, Manuel Sorozano, and a young boy, 15 years old, Nelson Lemus. And as they were driving on that road between these two towns, men opened fire on their car, killing all three of them. And as we look at the story of Romero, the Romero that emerges after this assassination of this priest is an amazing figure. But if we focus just on that one moment, 
We've lost crucial pieces of this man's conversion story and part of the power of his story. So to understand him properly, we need to take a few steps back from 1977 and go back to 1970. 1970 was a year that Oscar Romero was appointed auxiliary bishop of San Salvador. There he was known, as one biographer called him, the Little Inquisitor. He caused much controversy, and for those in the Salvadoran church who were uh, trying to forge the path of, of a church that was being transformed, Remember, in the 1960s, we have the Second Vatican Council that transforms global Catholicism. In 1968, the Latin American bishops gather in the Colombian city of Medellin and talk about a church in their continent under radically different circumstances. They had met 13 years earlier, but in 1955, these Latin American bishops said, the primary problem in our continent is the lack of priests. In 1968, it was the cry of millions who suffer from poverty, malnutrition, unemployment, underemployment. They cry to the heavens for justice. So the church was transforming in this period of time. Priests were being involved in a new pastoral initiative in El Salvador, forming small communities of people who would reflect on the Bible and look at their society and say to themselves, you know, the injustices in our society are not God's will. I don't have to live a life just kind of enduring these injustices and hoping for a better world in the next life. The gospel calls us to make this world look more like the reign of God that Jesus preached a reign of justice, a reign in which people flourish. That church that was making these moves was simply opposed by Auxiliary Bishop Romero. It scared him. The traditional faith that he was raised on was one that legitimized the status quo. As the author Philip Berryman has said, look in any Latin American city, Go to its capital, its center, and what do you see there? In one part, you see the, the, the capital, the government building. And what do you see across the plaza? The church. Each one legitimating and supporting the other. This was the colonial Catholicism that Oscar Romero was raised in. This was what he knew. And so those who would raise voices critiquing the situation were not welcome. In 1972, the Jesuit high school, the Externado San Jose in San Salvador, uh, began a project of social awareness with their students, taking them outside of the school and exposing them to the poverty that was all around them. And then in their classes, they began discussing, well, what are the causes of this po uh, poverty? What is the economic reality, the situation of our country? And so these, these sons of some of the wealthiest families in El Salvador would come home talking about these classes. Well, these parents were scandalized. Because to talk about social justice in this period meant one thing, and it was called communism. The Jesuits are indoctrinating our sons in communism. Who can we go to for help? Bishop Romero. And so he published an editorial in the Archdiocesan newspaper, Orientación. Jesuits distributing literature of a known red origin. It caused a national scandal. It seems, okay, a few parents complaining about a high school. No, no, no. These, these are hearings, national hearings on this case. Um, in the end, those teachers and the high school were acquitted, but somebody had already burnished their reputation, and that was Bishop Romero. He was opposed to these progressive elements. Now, it wasn't that he was a heartless human being. In fact, Romero was known as a charitable person. 
His encounters with those who were poor was as a simple man. And he was always known to have change in his pocket. And he would speak to those perhaps uh, under the influence of alcohol, those who had nowhere to sleep. And he was a very charitable person. And his vision was to try to persuade those powerful people in his country to be more charitable. Yet his mind did not have the capacity yet to talk about a transformation of the society in the language of justice. He was very suspicious of a new theology that was emerging, this so-called liberation theology. And he kept to himself a very private man. Uh, priests who would attend these priest-senate meetings would describe him sitting in the back against the wall with his arms folded. It was this man who then, uh, a few years later, in 1974, would be promoted to bishop in the Diocese of Santiago de Maria. It was a rural diocese, and there we begin to see a different Romero emerge. Some saw it as a, a promotion, others see it as a kind of kick upstairs because of all the controversy he was, he was uh, fomenting in the capital. But it was here in this rural diocese that Romero encounters a new reality. This is rural El Salvador. This was El Salvador of the coffee harvest, of those who would spend 14, 16 hours of back-breaking work and only get pennies a day for their labors. A year passed. But in the second year, Romero turned to uh, another priest who worked in the diocese, and he said, you know, it's, um, it gets kind of cold in the evenings. Uh, where do all these people sleep? Well, Monsignor, they, they sleep outside. They, they sleep in the trees where, wherever they can. There's nowhere indoors. Oh, that, that, that simply won't do. We, we have a school here that, that, that no one uses. Let's open it up and offer them hospitality. It's interesting, huh? a whole year before he noticed. But it was in that place, opening those doors, that he began to converse with these farm workers and hear their stories of suffering, of hardship. One plantation, coffee plantation, was known as La Tortilla because the only food rations that you got there was a tortilla. You didn't even get rice and beans like other places offered. This was a hard, hard existence. And it began to open Romero's eyes to a new reality that he hadn't quite seen before. That reality was brought home in an even more powerful way when news came out from a small town in his diocese called Tres Calles. Six people, two adults, four young men, were taken in the middle of the night and murdered. Two of them were shot, four of them were hacked up with machetes. Why? Why such a brutal act of violence? Well, these men and young men had been part of a center called Los Naranjos. And what they did there was catechesis, uh, Bible study, but they were also taking classes in the national reality. They were studying the economics of the country, its political history. And they began um, protesting for better wages, organizing other groups of workers to demand fair wages for their labors. When you begin to demand justice in El Salvador, tragically, it means death. It means violence. Romero was overwhelmed by the incident. He writes movingly about the tears of these mothers and widows talking about their loved ones who had been murdered. And as they were gathered there, the priest of his diocese said, Bishop Romero, we have to protest this. You need to speak and condemn this awful act of barbarity. And Romero said, no, no, there'll be no public statement. That will cause scandal. I know the president personally. I will call him. I will speak to him. 
and will do this thing without scandalizing the church or the government. So we see a man of compassion, a man who was moved to tears, but one who wasn't quite ready uh, to confront the powers that be. So it was in February of 1977 when it was announced that the replacement for Archbishop Chavez, who had been Archbishop for nearly 40 years, can you imagine? 40 years? Uh, a genera- two generations had known no one else as the archbishop. He was going to be replaced by none other than Oscar Romero. Now, for many in San Salvador, this was horrible news. The inquisitor is coming back to town. What is he going to do? Will he dismantle any, or will he dismantle all of the progress that had been made, the organization, uh, the conscientization? the awareness, the engagement of those in the churches. What was going to happen? Everyone wondered. But it must be said that those members of the government and the oligarchy that lobbied the Vatican to have him appointed expected him to settle things down, to put the church in order, back to its colonial silence, and concerned with only those things spiritual. Then it happened. March 12th, 1977, the assassination of Rutilio Grande, Nelson Lemus, and Manuel Solorzano. If things weren't bad enough with Romero being named Archbishop, this progressive side of the church lost its leading voice, Rutilio Grande all seemed to be lost. And yet that night, Romero came. Romero witnessed the bodies. And he gathered those people around him, especially those priests who had worked with Grande, and said, what should I do? What should I say? This was a man who had been going through transformation, through changes, and now it was all laid bare. What would he do in the face of this horrible assassination? He made two crucial decisions that show something remarkable in him. The first one was what would be called la misa unica, That is, that the funeral mass for these three figures, this Jesuit priest, this elderly man, and this young boy, would be the only mass celebrated in the country. If a Catholic wanted to go to mass that Sunday, they were going, or listening to on the radio, the funeral mass for these three. Many were deeply horrified. How could you do such a thing? Even other bishops in the Salvadoran Bishops' Conference. How could you do this politicizing mass like this? The second decision that he made was that until the government would investigate these murders in satisfactory fashion, he would no longer attend any governmental ceremony. Now, this was an important decision, particularly in 1977, because it was an election year. In just two months, El Salvador would be inaugurating a new president, General Carlos Humberto Romero. No relation. You always have to say no relation because they have the same last name. Fraudulently elected. In fact, I know a man whose father was in the military, and they were ordered to stuff the ballot boxes. Right? This is a long history of fra- fraudulent elections in El Salvador. But never, never in the history of the country had the archbishop boycotted an inauguration. Once again, horrified cries from some of his fellow bishops, how could you be politicizing this in this way? To which Romero simply said, when was it not political? for an archbishop to attend the inauguration of a president. For Romero, the question wasn't whether it was politics, it was the what, right? The how, which we'll get to. 
But this Romero, who is willing to proclaim the Misa Unica, who is willing to boycott governmental ceremonies, is a different person than the one who had been auxiliary bishop just a few years earlier. Whereas he caused scandal at the Jesuit high school, just after he became archbishop, uh, the Colegio El Sagrado Corazón, a girls' school, decided to spend three days reflecting on the death of Grande and the others and of reading the documents from that remarkable meeting of Latin American bishops. Once again, a chorus of parents rising up saying, this is communism. But now they no longer had the supportive voice of Romero. Rather, the archbishop clarified, this is the faith. An important dimension of the faith. The Romero that emerged during his ministry as archbishop not only spoke powerfully of the need for charity to those who were poor, but demanded structural changes in society so that there would not be poor. He didn't speak just paternalistically to give a helping hand to the poor, but he defended the right of the poor to organize for themselves and to work for their own equality within society. He was no longer scared of a new theology, but embraced a vision of a reading of the gospel that meant the life and flourishing of all people. A vision of the church, as he says in his second pastoral letter, the church as a body of Christ in history, in a world, and transforming that world. This was a Romero who no longer was a private person who kept to himself, but consulted extensively with people. The line would form at the archdiocese, and people would come from miles away walking just to talk to the archbishop. And sometimes he would leave the other bishops waiting because an elderly woman had walked miles just to talk to Monsignor. And in the response, in La Misa Unica, we see someone who is willing, indeed, to cause some scandal if it means speaking for justice. In a conversation between him and um, the Jesuit provincial at the time, Cesar Jerez, um, Romero has a powerful statement. It's a lot of text, but I, I think it's worth our looking at this statement. And so as they're walking along, Romero turns to him, and, and, and Cesar Jerez, this, this Jesuit priest, asks him, you know, you've changed a lot in the past year. What, uh, what's going on there? And Romero said to him, you know, I was born into a poor family. I've suffered hunger. I know what it's like from the time you're a little kid. When I went to seminary and started my studies, I spent years and years absorbed in my books. And I started to forget where I came from. I started creating another world. When I went back to El Salvador, he finished his studies in Rome. So when I went back to El Salvador, he says, they made me the bishop's secretary in San Miguel. I was a parish priest there for 23 years, but I was still buried in paperwork. Then they sent me to Santiago Maria, and I ran into extreme poverty again. Those children that were dying just because of the water they were drinking. Those campesinos killing themselves in the harvests. You know, Father, he said, when a piece of charcoal has already been lit, you don't have to blow on it much to get it to flame up again. So yes, I changed, but I also came back home again. Romero's conversion is a kind of coming back home, but it's, but it's a coming back home to a different home. The furniture has been rearranged. The challenge for us is to come back to our world with the furniture rearranged. For Romero, it was to move to a faith that simply wasn't devoted to a heavenly afterlife, but looking at life in the present. It was one that was not simply devoted 
being charitable, but looking at his society and needing to transform it. So as we look at issues like racism, immigration, these are issues that cause us to look at our home in a new way. And as Romero constantly preached throughout his ministry, calls us to conversion, to be open to those whose cries are too often ignored. Children in cages at the border who silently live this suffering existence. That's our home. The famous monk of the 20th century, Thomas Merton, has a remarkable experience that he describes. He was in Louisville, Kentucky. He had left his monastery on this particular day. He was traveling and he's walking outside. And he describes very famously how on this corner of this street in Fourth and Walnut, he, he sees everybody around him in a different way. The realization that he says that I loved all of these people. They were mine and I theirs. That we could not be alien to one another even though we were total strangers. One of the most remarkable developments in Catholicism in the 20th and 21st century has been the realization of social sin. That sin isn't just restricted to those personal categories that we might know so well. Do I lie? Do I steal? Etc. Yes, these are sins and they shape our character in profound ways. But there are other sins that determine the lives of millions on our planet. With my students, I like to talk about the Martian perspective. Go to Mars and look at planet Earth and realize that the majority of the people on that planet are starving, are suffering from malnutrition, even though they don't need to be. Millions who need drugs but can't get them. Those who are migrating, forced to migrate, and yet can find no home. This is that new vision that Catholic social teaching and Romero embraced in his ministry that call us to a conversion today. Key to that conversion is the second dimension of Romero's ministry, that engagement of faith and politics. And for Romero, this was no easy task. This was a time in his country that was tumultuous, and the church found itself in the middle of many social sectors. The so-called oligarchy, this very, very small minority of the country that owned most of the land and controlled most of the wealth. The security forces, including the military, the army, but also other paramilitary forces who would conduct violence like we saw in Tres Calles, that village in Romero's old diocese. A middle class and a large pop, the, the majority of the population, these campesinos, farm workers, and urban poor. And there is the church encapsulating all in the middle of all. And this this was the church that Romero found himself archbishop of. And so, after the assassination of Rutilio Grande, and a couple of months later, the assassination of the priest Alfonso Navarro, Romero began to speak of a church that was persecuted. But fellow bishop, Bishop Alvarez, would say there is no persecuted church. As he put it, there are some sons of a church that wanting to serve lost their way and put themselves outside the law. In November of 1977, a priest, Miguel Ventura, of his diocese was kidnapped and was tortured. And when asked, Bishop Alvarez said, Ventura? He was tortured as a man, not as a priest. Right? He, he, he had this dualistic way, faith and the world. He also held the rank of colonel in the military, incidentally. This 
was the long history of colonial Catholicism that Romero found himself wrestling with in his own formation and in many of the bishops in his own Salvadoran Bishops Conference. And in February of 1980, he gave a very famous lecture. He was invited to speak in Belgium, this ancient and famous theological school in Leuven. And there he gave perhaps his most famous speech about the political dimension of faith in relation to the option for the poor, in which he makes two crucial points. The first is this notion that I mentioned earlier. The church doesn't exist on a realm outside of the world. Now let's think about the word politics for a, se a second. Politics has as its root the Greek word polis, the city. Politics is the life of the city. And for Romero, the church is in the city. Right? One could not speak about the church outside of politics. It was present, just as the presence of the archbishop was as the, at the presidential inauguration. So the question for Romero is not whether, if the church has a political role, but the how. What is it? And what are the criteria? What guides that involvement in politics? We know so well how religion can be distorted by politics, and our political discourse can be distorted by religious fanaticism. So what is Romero talking about here? This is where the preferential option for the poor comes in. For when Romero asks, what is the real world? His answer is, look to the world of the poor. How do you know the strength of a chain? You look to its weakest link. How do you know what the relationships in a society, how they function? You look at the reality of the poor. Certainly we who live in the era of fake news can identify with this notion that a lot of things can be said on TV, a lot of things can be said on the internet, but it's the reality of those who are most poor, who are most vulnerable, that reveals to us what our world is like. Are we in fact a society of freedom, of democracy, of justice for all? Look to our prison system, and we have a painful answer to that question. So for Romero, the involvement of politics means uh, listening to that voice of the poor, hearing their reality. But it also meant not giving in to the temptation to make our own political party, our own issue, our own ideology, an idol. So Romero, of all things, talked about idolatry. And, you know, immediately visions in your head of golden calves or something like that might pop up. But when Romero talked about idolatry, he talked about that making our party the only right and demonizing those who don't agree with us. That is the abuse of religion in politics. So he's, he's forging a very uh, difficult path of commitment, of involvement, while at the same time recognizing other voices, of not latching on in idolatry of our own position. That engagement of Romero's was not just a political one, but the engagement of the church in trying to establish just in his country, reflected back on his own faith. It wasn't like he had faith here that he just applied, but rather his involvement, his commitment, his solidarity with those who were poor began to have him reflect on his own faith in a new way. So, for instance, the notion of transcendence, which for so long represented to Romero the otherworldly dimension of God. He begins to talk about transcendence in a different way. That the element of transcendence that ought to raise the church toward God can be realized and lived out only 
if it is in the world of men and women. God is present in our world. God is in those faces of the most vulnerable. So if one wants to pray, if one wants to reach toward God, the discovery is that the discovery is God is around us. That's the transcendence that the church seeks for. And in his second pastoral letter, he outlines three important points that should guide the church's politics in the world. Essentially, the argument is this. How should the church be in history? History is always changing. And so the church needs to respond to those changes in history. In fact, to be traditional, right? In, in our minds, very often, traditional means doing the same thing. It's a tradition. We do it over and over again, same thing. But for Romero, tradition is a verb. It's a thing that we do. And what is it? It's being faithful to the example of Christ but in the very changing circumstances of our world. St. Francis of Assisi was a remarkable model of Christ for his time. St. Ignatius of Loyola was a remarkable example of Christ in his own time. And so what did a look at the Gospels, a look at Jesus' ministry in the New Testament, what does that reveal about what the church should do? For Romero, the first thing was to denounce sin and especially those social sins that I mentioned earlier. How did he do that? He did it primarily in his preaching. His Sunday cathedral homilies became one of the most important events in all the country. In fact, it was said that you could go through a town, just walk down its main street, and whether through car radios or through the windows of houses, you could walk the entire length of the town and hear Romero's whole homily, not missing a word. Everyone was listening to Romero, whether they liked him or not. Now, I've heard my share of homilies. Some good, some not so good. Romero carried out a traditional task. He talked about the readings at Mass. But what else did he do? He talked about what he called the news of the week and would give events that in a country that had a completely censored news media were sometimes the only place that could be heard. If people knew of human rights violations, they'd go to the archdiocese and they would hear on Sunday Romero mentioning their loved ones who were kidnapped, their loved ones who had disappeared, when they went to the police stations, they said, we don't know where they are. Never heard of them. Only in Romero's homilies could you hear this denunciation of repression that was going on in the country. So the first step, denouncing sin. The second was proclaiming good news, and especially to those who were poor. Which kind of begins to change the role of the church. Think about this. Romero organized a team of young lawyers. The group was called Socorro Judicial, Judicial Mercy. And any report of human rights abuses, they would run and investigate. They'd take testimonies, they'd take pictures. And these were essential for establishing that these human rights abuses were taking place. So that years later, 14 years later, at the end of the Salvadoran Civil War, when the United Nations was putting together its Truth Commission on the war, it was Socorro Judicial's records that often gave them so much information. Now, for some people, the compiling of news on human rights abuses, that's not the work of the church. But for, for Romero, it was a powerful work of the church. It was needed. It was part of that documenting of the sins of the nation and also proclaiming a good news that justice will be served. An organization of mothers of disappeared called Comadres, basically laughed at by the authorities until the archdiocese supported this group and their claims were heard. So these were the kinds of actions that transformed Romero and his vision for what the church could do. Of course, we know how the Gospels end. And when Christians imitate the example of Christ, 
very often it involves the cross. The picture you see here of, is Higinio Alas. He and his brother Chencho were some of the first organizers of communities in El Salvador in the late 60s. He's holding a placard of the Mano Blanco, the white hand. It was the signature of one of El Salvador's uh, toughest death squads, the UGB, the Union de Guerreros Blancos, the White Warriors Union. And if you saw the white hand on your house, on your car, it was a signal of one thing. You are going to be a target of assassination. So many in his church endured persecution. Catechists, delegates of the word, priests. I know one woman who worked in the ministry of Rutilio Grande. And in working with farm workers and asking them, what do you need? They said, well, we work all day and then we go to the scales, but we don't know how to count and we don't know how to read and write. So we, we don't know what to ask for if we're being paid fairly. So what did they do? The church began a literacy program, teaching them to read and write and count. In just a few weeks, it was successful as these farm workers began to d demand their just and promised wages. Of course, with every success came repression. In the middle of the night, her door was kicked in. She was grabbed by four men, a hood placed over her head, and thrown into the trunk of a car that drove for hours. When she finally had that hood removed, she was in a kind of underground cell where she endured unspeakable torture. She was eventually thrown into a body, a pile of bodies of others who had endured this torture, her captors thinking her dead. But there was somebody walking in the distance who heard crying. Oh, she was eight and a half months pregnant. And the trauma of the torture forced the, the labor to begin. And because of those cries, she was saved. That baby tragically died. But she lives on. She lives in the United States now and works with the victims of trauma. What was her crime? teaching people to count and to read. And she did this out of the motivation of faith, of what the church should be doing. Six priests of Romero were assassinated during his time as archbishop. And in his homilies, in these funeral masses, he makes powerful statements about martyrdom today. Now, the root of the word marturion, martyr in Greek, is witness. It's what you do at a trial in court. You give witness. And for him, martyrs are messengers of reality. Right? Just as he said that the world of the poor says something about our world, so too these martyrs reveal something about reality in our world. Romero challenged all believers to become, as he said, microphones for God and to live up to the example of these messengers of reality. I've often been asked, did Romero know he was going to be killed? Well, he might not have known it that very day, but he had a very strong sense. In the last few months, Salvador, this very good friend who had been his driver for years, uh, he told him, you know, I, I don't want you to drive me anymore. I'm going to drive my own car now. Because if somebody bombs the car, if somebody kills me, I don't want anyone else to be killed. So he, he had that sense. Just before he was killed in 1980, he was on a retreat, and he, he was actually scolding himself once again. Um, for being fearful of dying. Um, but he writes in his diary of that retreat, if this is the path God wants me to go down, then I have to do it. I have to tell one more story regarding this. Um, Father Gustavo Gutierrez, uh, who's known as the father of liberation theology, a Peruvian priest, knew Romero pretty well. 
Whenever he would travel from Peru northward, he would often stop in El Salvador and visit him. He describes the last phone call that he had with Romero. They're talking, and when you finish a conversation like that in Spanish, often you say, cuídate, take care, take care of yourself. And so sure enough, they're wrapping up their conversation, and Father Gutierrez said to Romero, cuídate, Monseñor. Dead silence on the phone. Finally, Romero says, you know, Gustavo, if I were really were to take care of myself, I'd have to leave my country. But I can't. I have to stay here with my people. Within a week, Monsignor Romero was assassinated. On Sunday, March 23rd, he gave one of those famous, perhaps the most famous, of his cathedral homilies. Famous because in a crucial moment, he says, I would like to address the members of the National Guard, the army. And he said to them, the law of God is above any human law. And the law of God is thou shalt not kill. Stop killing your brothers and sisters. And so very famously, he says, I beg you, I order you to stop the repression. Now, those who were operating the radio controls at that moment heard this amazing static. And they thought, oh, no. The radio station of the archdiocese had been bombed several times, the transmitter destroyed. And also, the government had used interference signals to try to block the transmission of the homily. And they thought, oh, this is so amazing. And perhaps it has been lost only to realize that that static was not interference. It was the applause from that crowd in the cathedral that knew this repression so well. The next day, he was celebrating a small mass in the chapel where he lived. He didn't live in a large palace reserved for the archbishop. He lived in a small room adjacent to a cancer hospital that was run by an order of nuns for whom he had celebrated Mass for years. A tiny room that you can visit still today in San Salvador. It was the anniversary of a woman, a woman from the oligarchy, as a matter of fact. So in the year commemoration of her death, a small Mass was said. And it was during this Mass that an assassin's bullet pierced his heart. It was an exploding shell. So as it hit him, it went throughout his body, and he died of the massive blood loss, March 24th, 1980. What is the legacy of Monsignor Romero for us? It's not an easy question, and as I said earlier, it's not a closed one. It's one that we all need to keep answering every day. I can tell you two things he's not. <laughs> Romero is not a middle way. In his canonization, he's often portrayed as between uh, a right-wing government and left-wing guerrillas, kind of in this abstract no place. That was not Romero's way. Romero was in the soil. He was with his people. Again, he didn't take partisan politics but he was politically involved, and it would be erroneous to remove him into some abstract place, as some want to. Nor is he simply a martyr for sentimental love. The love that Romero preached was a committed love. It was a dangerous love. It was a costly love. And so to think about his legacy I'd like to conclude with three points, three famous lines in Christian history. The first one is a line in the liturgy that is said by Catholics toward the end of Mass. Agnus Dei qui tollis peccata mundi. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. A great part of Romero's legacy is the call for every person to remove to participate in removing the sin of the world. And to see the wider implications 
Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to make somebody poor today. But when we buy the materials from sweatshot labor, we participate in structures of sin that need to be confronted, that need to be combated, removing the sin of the world. Irenaeus, an ancient Christian father, said, quod non est assumptum, non est sanatum. That which is not assumed is not saved. It was language from Christological controversies, and the point was, Jesus Christ was a real human being. Christians believe that God became flesh in the world. That's what incarnation means, to become flesh, carne. The church should no less do that as well. It needs to become, we need to become flesh, be present in those places, in our world, in our country, in our state, in our city, in our small communities where there is need. That's how we incarnate ourselves. And finally, another saying of Irenaeus is, Gloria Dei vivens pauper. His was Vivens Homo, and the, the glory of God is the living human being. But Romero modified it slightly. The glory of God is the living poor. His legacy is one who saw the presence of God in those who were most marginalized, and those who would seek God will find God at the margins. And there is the living God, a living God of commitment, a living God of solidarity, a living God of transformation and hope. Romero was a saintly man, and in many ways very traditional. He was a man of prayer and a man of holiness. But he also asks us to expand our definition of holiness, to include engagement in transforming our world, to recognizing those poorest voices, those most vulnerable voices, and being incarnated in that world in the effort to transform this world and make it more like the reign of God that Jesus preached. In this way, Oscar Romero becomes an icon for us and a saint for our times. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. At this point, we do have some time for questions. So a couple of my colleagues will um, have mics available. And so if you just raise, their, raise your hand, they'll come uh, to you uh, with questions for Dr. Lee. Hi, um, I'm Brazilian, and I also studied theology in Brazil. I have a question for you. I mean, uh, was, I like this presentation, wonderful. I really appreciate it, and I like uh, thank, you. thank you very much. Um, I, I would like to hear something about uh, the U.S. involvement in his killing, because it, the connection with uh, the military regime that daily received uh, millions and millions of dollars from the U.S., mm -hmm. uh, I think that is an important piece in this uh, narrative. Absolutely. Yeah. So if I heard correctly, a question about the, the U.S. involvement and its support of this regime, there's no question about it. And, um, and although it, it paled in comparison to what would occur after Romero's assassination, because it's really during the Salvadoran Civil War that we see the United States pouring billions, billions of dollars into El Salvador. But even during Romero's time, there's no question that the Salvadoran government do, drew support economically, politically, from the U.S. government. In fact, um, uh, Jimmy Carter and his administration were lobbying uh, Pope John Paul II in an effort to try to have Romero silenced. Um, correspondence from Cyrus Vance um, and, and others in uh, the Carter White House um, trying to um, silence Romero to quiet him. And there is no doubt um, that, that El Salvador is completely shaped 
uh, by the U.S.'s control. It's a dollarized economy. You go to El Salvador today, you're spending U.S. dollars. Um, so that adds uh, the other wrinkle here. When you read and when you discover the story of, say, liberation theology in El Salvador, on the one hand, it's a story of people um, from, from the bottom up being empowered. But what I find um, particularly uh, compelling about figures like Monsignor Romero or Ignacio Villacuria, the Jesuit who was president of the university there, who himself was assassinated in 1989, was that these were men of power. Romero was the most powerful churchman in his country. But what did he choose to do with that office? Right? So as we find ourselves in the most powerful country in the world, we are asked that same question. And we are called to face up to the tragic uh, foreign policy that we have exercised not just in El Salvador, but throughout Latin America for decades now. And sadly, we see some familiar voices returning uh, to Venezuela, for instance. But um, so, so th this is another reason why I find um, Romero y Acuria particularly relevant Many have said to me, well, you know, Romero canonized as a saint. You know, he's been a saint in El Salvador for years. And that's true. But I think it's important that the, that the global church recognized him because it underscores the fact that now he's everyone's challenge and his legacy should challenge us all. And particularly those of us in countries of privilege, those of us whose histories have to be reckoned with. So it's an excellent question. Very excellent presentation, Dr. Lee. And, uh, um, as I mentioned, I've been traveling around the country for the last three and a half weeks. And uh, in your presentation in the beginning, you mentioned about uh, Dorothy Day not wanting to be considered a saint because it almost removes her. And I, I had that observation. I was in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, where the... Um, iconic sit-in at the Woolworth's counters by the black people, and it's now a museum. And I, and I remarked to myself, you know, how much they've cleansed this image, you, you know, in the towns and everything. But when I got into the, uh, into the country, I saw Confederate flags flying. And so your point, to, you know, is so well taken. We have to keep this image alive. And uh, do you have any comments on that? No, uh, other than to say that uh, with figures like King, with figures like Dorothy Day, with a figure like Romero, again, to underscore the fact that the, the legacy is never closed. It's not frozen. So many people said, ah, he's a saint now. Great. But it's only just begun. And, and to really hold on to that challenge, that challenging aspect of, of these figures' legacy that makes us uncomfortable, right? Romero should make us uncomfortable as well as inspired and everything else. And, it, and it's a holding on to that and, and seeing, I mean, in the wake of this awful uh, sex abuse scandal, to talk about Catholicism today is a precarious topic. Um, but it's a revelation to see a faith that is so meaningful, that is so powerful, um, it, 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 it really should transform and hopefully inspire and, and, and go beyond the borders of the church. I mean, this is a figure who shows uh, what commitment, what solidarity uh, with others can mean. And that, that goes beyond denominational or religious boundaries as well. So I think uh, the other dimension is this is a figure who is open to so many others, such a wider circle. And that's the challenge of his sainthood now, um, to make sure that that, that salt, you know, that, that uh, challenging edge is preserved in, his, in, in the memory. Um, hello, uh, Miguel, a student here. Ah, great. Um, going back to the point of United States foreign policy in Latin America, did Oscar Romero ever directly criticize United States imperialism, or did the 
larger Jesuit liberation theology ever criticize anything that the United States was doing? Well, the most direct thing is he wrote a letter to Jimmy Carter, the president. And uh, Romero, you know, and, and Carter had a reputation for honoring human rights and proclaiming himself a born-again Christian. So uh, Romero writes a letter to him, and it's a, you know, a public letter, um, for which he was excoriated from the Vatican and others in his bishop's conference, um, saying, please do not send foreign aid. The aid that you're sending to our country is only being used to repress it. Um, and so it was a, a direct, and this was what caused so much panic in the Carter White House and in Congress. And although uh, funds were suspended for a short while, they, they were resumed all too quickly, um, even with the assassination of the four churchwomen in December of the same year that Romero was assassinated. Um, but especially with the ascendance of Reagan in the White House and, and just the transformation of the Salvadoran Civil War into this anti-communist show, uh, you know, showdown, um, we, we would pour five, nearly $5 billion into, into the country. So yes, he did directly interject um, uh, and, and begged Carter to stop foreign aid because it, it was military aid, but that went basically unheard. And just to point out, th there was not unanimity in that church. Uh, at Romero's funeral, this is the archbishop being assassinated, only one of the Salvadoran bishops even attended the funeral. Um, that, that's amazing to me. Five bishops boycotted Romero's own funeral. They didn't show up. Um, so those tensions um, were there, and I think to some degree are still there. So, so it's, uh, it's not um, a Hallmark card legacy, but it's a legacy of, of confrontation sometimes and controversy, to be sure. So I want to go to that. Please join me once again thanking Dr. Lee. At this point, we have the opportunity to continue the conversation of both the inspiration and sometimes uncomfortable tensions in uh, Oscar Romero's legacy uh, with food in the lobby, so please join us for that. Uh, and we also encourage uh, those of you in our audience to return to our fall 2019 McCarthy Lecture, uh, where we have Dr. Michael Batella of St. John's University here on October the 2nd. Uh, Father Batella will help us welcome the St. John's Bible to St. Edward's University for the 2019-2020 academic year. So mark your calendar. Look forward to that. Thank you all again for coming, and please join us in the lobby.